And my name is uh, William R. Curie. Okay. Uh, well, tell me a little bit about uh, your background, what your military background, and what brought you to uh, the service. Okay, I was uh, born into a military family. My dad uh, was a career officer in the Air Force for 28 years. Um, so we moved around uh, in the f 50s and early 60s and living at Air Force bases. And so uh, I've, I was in, enthralled by the planes and being in the military. My brother also served in the Army after he graduated from high school. And my sister, she served in the Army as an operating room technician. And then uh, when I graduated from high school, I wanted to go to one of the academies and I applied to the uh, Air Force Academy and uh, didn't get in. Uh, but they wanted to send me to the Air Force Academy prep school. So I enlisted in the Air Force. Uh, as an Airman third, and went to basic training and then went to Colorado Springs and spent a year at the prep school and got a qualified alternate to the Air Force Academy in 66 and also got a congressional appointment to West Point. So I decided to take the sure thing and, and go to West Point because at the time the Army was still flying planes. Uh, and it wasn't until my junior year 1968 when the Army and the Air Force came to an agreement that uh, the Army would just give up all its small planes and, except the little fat planes and fly helicopters and the Air Force would be the, the planes and the... Uh, so I knew I had an opportunity to go back to the Air Force because I had a, a year prior service in the Air Force and my dad was a career officer so that's when I decided that I would take a commission in the Air Force and when I was going through that process I was assured of a slot for flight school, so that, that was what I wanted to do. I wanted to be a pilot. So tell me about your service in Vietnam and what you were in the Air Force. What was the mission? What, we, what, what airplane were you flying? What was your mission? When I uh, finished uh, flight school, uh, like anything else, the, the Air Force allocates planes, and most of the planes that were coming out were the KC-135 tankers, C-141s and the B-52s. Uh, so I th thought about it hard and I said, you know, if I'm going to fly in a plane, uh, I want to have an, a, some way of getting out of it, you know. And the B-52 was the only one that had an ejection seat in it. So I just said, well, I'll go to SAC. That should be a good assignment. Uh, so I was uh, assigned to uh, the 744th Bomb Squadron, 456 Bomb Wing at Beale Air Force Base. But prior to, prior to that, we went to water survival down at Homestead and then went to nuclear weapons school at, uh, at um, Fort Worth, Texas, and then survival school at Fairchild, and then uh, to Castle Air Force Base uh, where we trained in the B-52. It was the uh, F model that we were training in. And then uh, I got to my Beal in January of 72, and upgraded uh, to a co-pilot on the G model, 60 days, and uh, started sitting alert. Basically, we sat, that was our mission. Uh, two weeks out of the month, we were, we had two bombers and a tanker on alert at the end of the runway. Um, and um, it wasn't until late March April, actually, when the uh, North Vietnamese launched their Easter offensive into uh, uh, South Vietnam. The Air Force did have B-52D models flying the Arclight sorties out of uh, Utapau in the Thailand with a, a few out of Anderson Air Force Base. And the crews would get selected from the other, all the SAC bases, <clears throat> and go do a six-month tour and, and, and come back. So, um, but when the Easter event offensive started, uh, President Nixon ordered all the remaining D models that were in country in the United States and all the G models to South Viet, uh, Southeast Asia uh, to support the war effort. So there wasn't room in Utapau for any more B-52, so all the the D models coming over in the G models, I think there was about 59 D models that was, were stationed at Anderson Air Force Base on Guam, and there was approximately 90 G models. So we had about 140 B-52s uh, 
on, in Anderson. Um, and we started flying missions and supporting uh, uh, the South Vietnamese uh, efforts in the South. Yeah, so we got to Guam and uh, we volunteered and flew, ferried one of all the B-52s from, uh, from Beale to uh, uh, Anderson. We figured that would be more fun than riding in the back of a KC-135. So we landed there, we had about a week orientation um, and then we started flying um, uh, missions. And uh, from Anderson Air Force Base to Vietnam and back is about 6,000 miles. So our flights were anywhere from 12 to 14 hours, depending on. So we couldn't fly as often. So we, we, the, our routine was we'd fly three days, fly a day, crew rest, fly another day, crew fly. So three days of flying. And then there were so many planes on Guam that the maintenance personnel couldn't do all the activities. So the, we had a four-man crew out of our crew, which we would be taxi duty. We'd actually go out and taxi the B-52s from where they landed to the fuel, fuel pits that get dumped and then to their final uh, parking place where the bombs would be loaded on them. And then uh, the, another day, we do that one day, and then the next day would be a duty crew, so the whole crew would go out. And what we would do, there was always three B-52s that would be launched for a mission out of Guam. And we would have two spares. So the duty crew would go to the second spare and pre-flight it right up to takeoff, re remove all the pins uh, from the bombs, and then we'd go to the number one spare and do the same thing, except we would start it and we'd be waiting there in case one of the three B-52s aborted. Then we wouldn't fly, but we would, while they were parking their plane and doing a bag drag, we called it, they'd be getting out. We would be taxiing to the end of the runway and then we would get do it right up to engine takeoff. Then we would get out, they would get on, and then we would go immediately to the number two spare to start it up if he didn't, and uh, he would take off. So if they didn't take off, we would have bring the number two spare around to him. But that usually didn't happen. Usually the uh, the second, uh, the first spare. And so that we do that one day, and then we'd have a day off, and then we'd go through the cycle all over again. So uh, and that was happening 24 hours a day. About every 45 to 50 minutes, there were three B-52s taken off of Guam. Uh, and it, it was kind of nice in the, in the sense that we had so many planes in the air that we had plenty of room on, on Guam. Uh, and we, that was our job. And then we served six months, 179 days, and then they'd rotate us back to the state for 28 days, and then we'd go back on another uh, six month deployment. All right, so tell me about the day that you, you'll never forget the day you were shut down. What was, what, how did that happen? Okay, well, we were home on our 28-day break in November of 72, and we were listening to the news and Kissinger and everyone saying, peace is at hand. So we were hoping, well, maybe we won't even have to go back. Or if we did, it would just be to go back and bring one of the Beale airplanes back. But, but then the North Vietnamese uh, walked away from the peace tables. <clears throat> And so we, we got back in early uh, December, and uh, I think we flew like maybe one time. And uh, then we had a, a came to a, a, a standstill. I mean, and we're watching all these fighters come in and the 141s coming in, and, and uh, we started recovering all the bombers that were in the air that we had so many planes on the ground there that when they had to actually use one of the active runways and active taxiways to park the B-52s because they didn't have room for them. And so we thought, well, maybe this was a good sign and, until we had a big meeting, uh, base command, uh, the squadron commander and the wing commander called everyone in and announced to us that um, the war is not over, okay, we're going uh, uh, three-day maximum effort uh, against Hanoi, North Vietnam. And so we're sitting there going, wow, okay. And so it was supposed to be, we were briefed it was a three-day operation. Um, we didn't know until I got back and I got the actual battle order that it says to continue if, if it needs to. So we were duty crew for the first couple days and because we were scheduled to go on the third night. And then basically it was three waves a night uh, for the first three for three nights, and uh, it was really impressive 
when the, we, they launched on the 18th, about three o'clock in the afternoon, Guam, you know, because it's about a, you know, a six or seven hour flight to Vietnam, which would put us in about nine, ten o'clock at night for the first wave. To sit there and watch a hundred B-52s take off one right after another. I mean, it was it was really amazing. And so we were the first night. I think we lost uh, three planes, two. Went, were lost over the north and one was, was able to get back. Uh, and then the th second night, uh, w we had no losses on all three waves, but we had a couple hits. So we were kind of, everyone was kind of think overconfident. And then on the third night at the briefing, our uh, wing uh, lead aircraft, com uh, the squadron, the aircraft commander was from uh, Seymour Johnson and he was a, he asked the, uh, the colonel, he said, why are we flying the same mission for the sixth time? And the general said, well, that's what the battle plan is. And so, and they told us that we couldn't do any evasive action or anything. We had to fly straight and level until we got our bombs out and then, uh, and then we could uh, take evasive action if necessary. So we were all con kind of concerned a little and so we, Took off on the night of the 20th. Uh, you know, it was a long flight going over. We refueled to top us off because we came across South Vietnam. We went up Laos, Cambodia, and then came back down Thud Ridge, which was the history of Vietnam, where, where all the 105s came down and were, sh were shot, shot up. And we were supposed to turn back around and go right back out instead of going straight across feet wet into the ocean, you know, and we had a 120 knot tailwind, which, you know, isn't, isn't uh, so all the, the stuff that they, preventative stuff that they did, the F-4s and everything, they dropped the chaff, but the chaff was just blown away with the, with the wind, so we never, didn't have our chaff corridor, and then going in to the first uh, IP, you know, uh, the lead calls, uh, uh, you know, bombs away, the EW's in the back going, pilot, Sam side, six o'clock. Kind of came up, looked at us, and went right back down again. And lead turned, and then two roll was level there, opened his bomb bays, and, and as soon as he opened his bomb bays, the EW goes, Sam side, six o'clock. And then two turned, and then uh, I kind of looked over at Terry, you know, and we kind of, cinched up into our seat there and I says, okay, we're number three, you know, this is, uh, this is the one. And as soon as we opened our bomb bay doors, the EW started calling up, Sam said, five o'clock, six o'clock, seven o'clock. And the la one of the last things he said was, pilot, I'm doing everything I can. And so we knew that uh, one of the D models blew up because the SAM blew up in the bomb train and the bombs just exploded right back up into the airplane. So we knew that we needed to get the bombs out. So the pilot reached up and jettisoned, so they all went out at the same time and then we just rolled up into about a 50 degree bank in our st steep turn. We had one SAM go right between the number three engine in the cockpit and blow up above us. And then we had the one that hit, shook the plane and then uh, we felt another one in our tail. So we had two hits that we knew of. But we were able to roll level. Uh, we were in a descent, about 3,000 feet per minute. Uh, the EW said, oh, pilot, look at all the holes back here. And the, and the gunners hit. And uh, Terry, the pilot, was flying, and I was trying to keep the fuel balanced because we had fuel leaks. And, uh, and it seemed like a long time because everything kind of slowed down. That is a kind of a truism. Everything, we're just doing what we're trained to do. We're reacting now. And, um, and about, um, yeah, I don't know, it was probably five, six minutes. The pilot says, well, crew, this looks like this is it. You know, I'm looking at him and says, well, let's make a decision. And he takes the yoke and he pushes it forward, pulls it all the way back, does one of these things like he would on pre-flight on takeoff and the plane is just diving down to the ground there. And so uh, and we had an agreement that the first one out, you know, the pilot would be the first one out. He wouldn't say bail out, bail out, bail out. He just ejects because then the red light comes on. and. Uh, we always had 
uh, on our crew was in a controlled bailout, you'd turn on the red light and it would be blinking. And then when the red light goes solid, you start bailing out. And so we always said, okay, don't wait for the light to blink. <laughs> uh, so he was the first one to go. We had a rapid decompression after that. And then you, hear, you could hear the plane. We're actually sitting on a Weber seat as a ballistic seat. I, I joke about it. I say we're actually sitting on a shaped IED, you know, basically to blow us up out of the plane. And I had got myself ready. I remember pulled the throttles back to Ida. We were going about 0.88 Mach at the time at 38,000, or about 30. 2,000 feet, and I got back in there, and you rotate the triggers, and the hatch will, and the B-52 just pops up about that much, and the jet stream takes the hatch off. So if the hatch doesn't go, then you got to get out of your seat and go find an opening to get out of. Um, but the hatch went, and right when I was about to squeeze the trigger, we took a hit on the right wing, and the plane just started rolling to the right. and knocked me out of position, so I just immediately got back squeezed the triggers, and I, I estimated we were going, you know, 500 miles an hour, and I hit that jet stream, and um, one of the concerns of going too fast is you, um, the arc of the seat coming out isn't as high as it would be if it's 250, so you're going faster, it's a lower arc, and you got that big tail behind you, that, you know, that would make, really make your day if you got, you know, got out and hit the tail. But uh, it was like hitting a stone wall, and that second later, that seat was just ripped away from us by the jet stream. And then, but while I was in the seats, my hands and arms just flailing, just got a hypered extension, my shoulders and my 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 hips and uh, my knees, and uh, and then the next thing I know, I'm just tumbling in, in the black. It's night, thirty about twenty-eight thousand feet. And I had to make a decision there because you're supposed to fall, free fall to 15,000 feet and your chute will open one second later. But um, I couldn't get in a free fall position. I was just tumbling and I, I, I figured if my time, this was my time, then I'd rather control my destiny. So I grabbed my D-ring and I popped it and I was still going way too fast. And the opening shock of the parachute just pulled me back and we wear those Nomex gloves that come up almost mid mid arm and I was holding the D-ring tight and it pulled my glove right off my hand. That's how fast we were going and I a stable and I look up there and I look up and I see I got some, a couple ripped panels. So I said I was just a nice ride down. We were the first of uh, five cells in the wave from our wave, uh, so we were right in the target area coming down, uh, watching AAA coming up, watching the SAMs come up. Um, and it was a full moon with a very light cloud level, probably around around 5,000 feet. So you could see this, the SAMs light coming up through the clouds. And then uh, <clears throat> I got down close enough to where I started hearing this noise and then it sounded like a bunch of ducks quacking but it was uh, Vietnamese on the ground yelling and, and screaming and all of a sudden you could, I could hear the crack of bullets coming by me so they they of course I had the old the 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 parachutes the round shoots but the parachutes that were on the D models that were doing arc light they had uh, swapped them out for the black you know combat shoots, but we still had the big orange and yellow, white survival suits, you know, so you could see them. And I knew with the condition of my legs that I was going to have a bad, I was going to have a uh, hard landing. And I, uh, I was going to have to do the best PLF that I could ever do. Uh, <clears throat> and so I'm, I'm getting ready. I'm coming down and I'm seeing this night. I never did a night jump before. I have never jumped before, you know, this was my... Uh, we parasailed in uh, flight school, you know, and that was it a couple times. But, but uh, um, I uh, started getting myself as best I could to hit the ground, and I hit the top. I hit the. I hit something, and I thought I was hitting the ground. And a second later, I. I didn't. I didn't hit the ground, and I kind of 
relaxed for a second. I said, you know, what is this? And what had happened is I had hit the top of a stand of bamboo about 20 feet in the air. So when I relaxed a little, then I slammed into the ground, um, dislocated my right leg, hyperextended my left leg, uh, but it didn't dislocate. And I'm lying on the ground, <clears throat> impelled in the bamboo, and I'm looking up there, and there's my chute up there 20 feet, you know, just, and I could hear the villagers yelling, and, and, uh, and I, and I, uh, I wasn't scared at the time. I was just doing what I was trained to do. So I took out my radio. I made uh, one last call, uh, Red Crown, this Quilt 3 Bravo. That was my position on the, the pilot was Alpha, I was Bravo. And then everyone had a, that I was on the ground. Um, and then I took the batteries out on my radio and tossed them with my right, with my right hand. My left hand was still kind of uh, useless to me, my right arm. And then, of course, we carried a 30 a gun. I had a 38 Smith and Wesson revolver, and I only had five rounds. We had 13 rounds, but I only had five rounds. I always kept an empty, cha empty cha uh, hammer on an empty chamber. So I took that out. I um, opened it up, dumped the bullets out, and threw them because I knew it was useless to me. It closed the cylinder, then I was smashing the radio so they wouldn't be able to use it. And about that time, I saw some movement, at a, you know, and I looked over there, and I had taken my helmet off because I had some bamboo that had gone up into my scalp right there. I took my helmet off. And I saw some movement, and all of a sudden hearing these getting shot at, they're just walking and, sh and spraying the, the, the fields. And I looked around, and here comes this little lady you know, I look at her and she's swinging a, a hoe, you know, and she cracked, got, caught me right across the side of the head. I dropped my gun, of course, uh, and then I was, you know, they were on me like uh, uh, a whole bunch of people. And one little guy picked up my gun and pointed it at me and started pulling the trigger. But, you know, I had thrown the bullets away. And that was the time I, I really got scared, is when I realized that they knew where I was and they were coming for me. Now, prior to that, you know, I w I'm Catholic, and I, you know, I said an act of contrition because I figured, you know, this was it. And uh, they, the main thing, they were actually, they wanted to get my equipment, and they were ripping my stuff off of me. And of course, I was injured, and it was, you know, it was all painful. And um, you know, they were beating me with uh, bamboo sticks and stuff. And then uh, four little militia guys show up. And they're the only ones that have weapons, the militia. And they actually just push the civilians off of me. And um, they were standing one, two at my feet and two up at my head. And the one guy, little guy, motioned for me to get up and follow him. And I shook my head and I pointed to my right leg, which was totally dislocated. And that was the only time I got any medical treatment that was in Vietnam is that he looked down at my leg, he shouldered his AK-47, he reached down, he grabbed my ankle, put his foot in my crotch, and he popped my knee right back in place, which was the best thing that could happen to it. Uh, and then they dragged me into the village, and um, the planes are pretty much gone, and everyone's starting to come out now into the village, and, and it was just, it was, uh, you know, I was, I was concerned, and one of the, um, the militia guy was asking me, Ruski? And I was thinking, he, he, does he think I'm Russian? Or is he asking me if I'm Russian? And I didn't know about, uh, and I, you know, I just said no. And I found out later that they had shot down some Russian planes that had been shot down, and they, they looked just like us, so they, they got some bad treatment, and Moscow didn't like that, so they said, be careful who you, who you get. So, and then they, the villagers came out, and they're getting kind of rowdy, so they moved me into a hooch. And a little lady came in, and I, I was actually treated fairly well by the civilians. You know, This was probably one of the first times they've ever been bombed in the uh, hist history of the war. Uh, this little old lady came in there. She washed my injuries, cleaned my wounds. Uh, and then a little older older guy. There was no young men. There were kids and old guy, old men, and and the women. Um, and uh, they came in and <clears throat> fed me some soup. And 
this the older guy was kind of you know how they squat down there you know and he was smoking a cigarette and he asked me if I wanted to smoke and I said no I shook my head and I was, I was watching his reaction and he was kind of like like I insulted him or something you know because he's trying to help me though then I I, I said smoke, you know, and he, his eyes, he smiled, he gave me a cigarette, and I, I, I don't know, I never smoked, but I, you know, I smoked, and, um, and um, he was all happy, and then later that night, we had another wave come in and bombing, and then uh, I had pro probably early in the morning, I don't know, I had no track of time, they had taken my watch and everything. Uh, uh, I didn't wear any jewelry, I, know, I, I took that off before I flew. Um, and they came in, the militia came in, and then they blindfolded me, and they t hog tied me, you know, behind the back like that, and they put me on a little wheelbarrow type thing in the wagon, and they started moving me through, and it was very painful, because they tied it real tight, and I had a piece of bamboo that had gone up into my arm, and it was bleeding. And he could see that I was in pain, and he actually took the rope off, you know, so I'm saying, you know, I wasn't expecting any of this. And then they turned me over to the regular army at another little village, uh, and, they, and that's where I saw my pilot for the first time. And when they put us on a little bus, and, and he was sitting in the back, and so I knew, I knew he was alive. And um, I was on this side of the bus, and when the guard went, went off the bus, I said, "Terry, how are you?" And we started, we communicated a little, and he said. He's fine, but he hadn't seen anyone either. And they took us to another place. It was like a little hospital place, and they brought us in, and Terry had dislocated one of his shoulders. I can't remember which one. And that night, I was. Uh, we spent the night, and they came in, and they were ejecting me with, I don't know what they were ejecting me with, but giving me these shots, and uh, which concerned me uh, a little. and. Um, I could see someone being allergic to something and you know and then just making it worse and then early that morning they took me out uh, and <clears throat> dumped me in the back of a Jeep a truck and I land on something soft and it made a noise you know and I, and I said and I realized it was another someone else I said who's this and it goes Roy it was my gunner and I said Roy this is Bill he says, how are you? I said, how you doing? He says, oh, he, was, he shattered his right leg. And I'm, he landed in the, in the river, luckily, and it probably saved, helped him, because um, it, it would have been harder of landing on than landing on the dirt. And they drove us village to another village, and we'd stop, and the people would come out, and they would yell and scream and hit us with sticks. And when they got rowdy, they'd drive us on to another village, and that's how we went made it into Vietnam, made it into Hanoi. And I was taken off and brought into the, uh, I could tell where I was, even though I was blindfolded, I could tell where I was, the big iron door opening and shutting, and then they put me in a cell and they dumped me on the floor and left me there. Um, and um, later, um, I couldn't tell where I was because it was pitch, pitch black. But every now and then the guard would come up you could hear him come, the, the keys would jingle, you know, and open the little sliding thing there and get some light in the room, and I realized that I'm in this little cell lying on the floor, basically, and all I had on was my underwear. Uh, and it was winter, and it was cold uh, in North Vietnam. You know, it was in the 50s. Sometimes it gets down in the 40s, but that was cold when you don't have anything. And a little later, they opened the door, brought it in, and threw uh, uh, a blanket and a mosquito netting in the room. And I just pulled that up on over me and, and spent, you know, and w went to bed, and went, fell asleep. And the next morning, three of them come in, and they started interrogating me. And that, that happened for like three days. They didn't want to ask me all these questions. And in English, so one of them spoke English. Yeah, one of them spoke very good English. Uh, 
and he came in with a with a medic. He had the white thing on there, like, and he would be like a, looking at my legs and my injuries, and while they're asking me questions. And of course, I knew they they knew everything about us because they had our flight suit. You know, had my we had the patches. We didn't do what we did today with black. You know, take everything off. You know, with the Velcro patches. So they knew we were flying B-52s. They knew we were from five. You know, from from Beale Air Force Base, and and so you know when they. Um, uh, I learned real quickly that if they asked a question, I could tell that they knew the answer. You know, if I if I didn't answer it, you know, they twist my leg or something like that. Uh, so I said, well, if, if he knows what the answer is, I'll tell him yes or no. But if I he's really starting to ask something that they I knew they didn't know about, I would you know make something up. I'd lie or I would I use my injuries too to kind of you know I'm, you know I'm hurting and, and stuff like that, but. They did that for about three days, and um, then on the night of the 22nd, early morning, uh, we hear the these planes coming in, and the siren goes off, and these planes, these jets are getting louder and louder and louder, and we're saying. Um, they must be hitting something close to the prison. And they drop, you could hear the bomb come in, the sound of the bomb, and it detonated, uh, the concussion from it. Actually, we were, I was in an interrogation, and they started to try to leave the room, but when the bomb went off, we all kind of met in the center of the cell, the table, the plasters coming off the wall, the cement bouncing around on the wall, and they're crawling out the door, and then you hear number two come in and do it, and. I mean, I'm, I, I couldn't hear for about a day after that. The concussion was amazing, and I just, every time it got close, I just rolled over against the wall, and then it was quiet. That blew my, the windows off the cell, it blew the door off the cell, and they just kind of left me there. I couldn't move, I couldn't walk anyways. And eventually they came back, put me on a stretcher, and took me down to another cell. And um, that was on Christmas, uh, the, and I was alone for another two days, and then Christmas Day, we were moved into a cell with nine other injured linebacker pilots, uh, crew, crew members. And then, then we started making contact with the older prisoners. Um, um, and they, they were saying, okay, guys, don't worry about anything. We're going home. Don't say anything. Don't sign anything. You know, we sign stuff under torture. and. You know, I didn't consider myself being tortured. I knew what the older guys went through. You know, I was manhandled uh, a little, but uh, they said they know uh, we're, they know they're going to have to release us. And, and, you know, and so. Um, so one second, I'm going to start and stop real quick. Okay. So actually, what happened to me? You know, my sh last mission, my shoot down, my first week in confinement was pretty much. What happened to all the uh, original guys, the guys, that, the old FNGs that we call them, that were shot down between 64 and 68. And then there was no one shot down from 68 until 72 almost over North Vietnam. There were uh, Americans that were captured in the South, soldier, uh, Army, uh, the Marines that were walked, they walked them up to Hanoi. I had my classmate at West Point, not my classmate, but he was a a year ahead of me, uh, in the same company, uh, he was captured in the south, and they walked him up to the north, John Anxious, and I didn't see him until we came out. I had gone to prep school at Air Force Academy, and two of my prep schoolers, we had three squadrons, red, blue, and green. I was in red squadron, uh, Bill Reich was in uh, green squadron, and uh, we had another guy in, uh, in a blue squatter, and, and so there's three of us there, you know. So I was like, what, what was the chances of that happening? Uh, and so f for the rest of my time there was pretty, the bombing went on through the 29th, and that in itself, those nights were, were scary, you know. Uh, we knew we were safe. Uh, but there were some bombs that were dropped long in, 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 in the city, but we knew we were pretty much safe. And the older guys were saying, well, we could tell the difference in the attitude from the North Vietnamese and the guards, because they were never bombed like this before. They were actually scared. So when the bombing stopped on the 29th, um, 
the older guys are asking, well, what does that mean? And I said, look, we were briefed it was a three-day operation. When they came back on the 21st, <clears throat> I was saying to myself, something's changed. You know, what are they doing? And they came back on the 22nd and the 23rd, you know, so I said, and then they stopped for Christmas. But then they came back on the 26th and I said, well, okay, something's not right. Uh, and I think in hindsight, looking back at that, you know, the night, the last night, we lost six planes. And I don't think that we could have stopped because that would, the North Vietnamese would have said, hey, we beat, we beat SAC, you know. I mean, that's my viewpoint, but I think it's pretty true. They, we had to keep going, you know, until they said, okay, we're done. And I think they realized that the best way to get us out was to sign a peace agreement. And once the United States pulled out, they would never come back in, you know, and which, which turned out to be true. You know, after Nixon was impeached and left office, Congress uh, reneged on their deal to give military equipment to South Vietnam, and they basically ran out. They couldn't uh, fight anymore, so that was what happened in 75. But So my time in there was, uh, the older guys, they joke about, here, Bill is coming in with his overnight bag. and. And I would say, well, my reply to that was, well, you know, sometimes it's better to be last in your class, you know, so. <clears throat> uh, but uh, I was, they moved us into a uh, uh, new guy village, all the sick and wounded. We knew we were gonna be the first ones out. The older guys would not come out until the sick and wounded were released. So I, I was in, on the f first plane back, uh, first plane out, and, uh, <clears throat> which was, uh, for me, it was exciting, but it was also to see the reaction of the older guys who had been there for, some of them, eight years, you know, that finally they're going home. And I was one of the first ones on the 141, and they took my crutches away. I was able to, to limp, like Chester on Gunsmoke, you know, I could, you know, I could limp. And, but trying to go up the ramp of the 141, you know, it was kind of hard. And did that exchange happen? I mean, when they at the airport, right? So our plane lands. <clears throat> our servicemen are there with the plane. But is that the only time you saw the first time you saw Americans was at the runway? Yep, actually at the runway. We and people ask, you know, we saw this plane fly over, and and uh, people say, what's that? And I, I said, well, it looks like a C-141. Well, the, it wasn't even built and in service when some of these guys were shot down. And I said, well, what's it? What's it look like? So well, it looks like a big. C-130 with, with jets, you know, and, uh, and they landed a, a, C a C-130 that brought in some radar equipment and then the 141 landed. And so, yeah, we, that was the first time. Uh, and the sick and wounded were released first. They'd marched us out and then they released us and we walked, we, everyone had an escort or the crew on the, uh, the planes would actually escort everyone to the, to the plane. And when I got to the plane, I started going up the ramp and I was having a little trouble and these two flight nurses, you know, air, military nurses come running down the ramp and they grab me under each arm and they're helping me up and I'm looking at them and I'm going, hmm. Because, you know, they were probably hand-picked. And they said, well, where do you want it? We got a nice bed over here. And I said, no. And I said, no. I said, I want to sit in this chair right here. The chairs were facing the back. I want to sit right here. And she goes, why do you want to sit there? And I said, because I want to see the expression on these older guys who haven't seen an American woman in eight years, their reaction, you know. And so we loaded the plane up and it was kind of quiet until we broke ground. And it was still kind of quiet until the pilot said, called back and said, we're feet wet. We're, so we're out of Vietnam airspace. And everyone just went, the older guys just went crazy. And then from there on, that flight to Clark, Everyone were up walking around. They had, they didn't have a lot of food for us because they didn't know what condition we were going to be in, and they wouldn't let anyone bring uh, food. They they had like these milkshakes and stuff like that, but they had cigarettes and stuff like that. But after we got back and they realized that the guys are in better health than they, th not in great health, but they're in better condition than they thought. The 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 nurses and everything started sneaking cookies and brownies and stuff on the on the plane and. I was in Clark for two days, uh, got there on the 12th, and then we took off on the 15th. The first 
plane back to the States. We flew to Hawaii, and then uh, we flew to uh, Travis for because uh, Terry and myself and uh, Al Brunstrom were going to get get off the plane. We'd be the first three Americans reunited with family, and um, and it turned out that we took off on the fifteenth and not paying much attention to it. But when we got back, it was Valentine's Day. It was the fourteenth because we crossed the international dateline. Now, when I go into the school, the elementary school, and I'm talking to the kids, and I'm, I'm telling them, you know, I was a time traveler. You know, I I took off on the 15th, and I got back a day early. You know, and they're looking at me, but they they're pretty smart. They knew it was the international dateline. But and then my wife, uh, she had got her, the wedding ring when they sent all my stuff back, and she wore it on a necklace around her neck, and. Um, and so part of this, as soon as we got united, she gave, she put it right back on my finger right there. And then I think that the, one of those pictures right up there shows that, uh, that when they lock you, that they uh, took the pictures. And so I went into the hospital for uh, six months, basically, re, uh, physical therapy, got a waiver to fly, uh, stayed at Beale, upgraded to aircraft commander, and then made a decision I was going to get out. And I worked at the officer's you know, the officer controller at the command post, and then I got out of the service and went to work for uh, H. Ross Perot in Dallas and worked for him for um, 30, uh, 12 years at EDS and then another 21 years at Perot System. So tell me about, I'm going to kind of segue to yep. coming back um, and the feeling from, from the veterans received from the public. You know, what, what was it like? coming back from the war, even as a POW, as far as the reception from? Uh, well, you know, I, 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 I talk about this, and I, I have, I felt some, I had some guilt about it, because I believe that the 500, the 600 of us that came home, we were the only ones that got a welcome back. Wherever we landed, there were crowds of people there, you know, waving the flag, welcome home. Uh, the press wanted to talk to us. I mean, we got a welcome home, and, and, and no one else did. And, and that, that bothered me for a while. And I always thought that, you know, from um, with, with the organizations that I work with now, is that we, you know, we, we, can, we can't ever let that happen again. But because even if you're against the war, you know, it's you can't be against the soldiers. We're, we're doing our job. And so I didn't see any of the, you know, that happened to but I know a lot of people when they got home they they landed they, they took their uniform off in the bathroom and they you know it was uh, they weren't treated well and, and through up until probably uh, Reagan you know it was um, the only thing you saw about Vietnam in the media was these these I mean, probably a lot of them weren't even Vietnam vets where they're wearing the, the long hair the, the hippie guys you know and as kind of a negative uh, a negative uh, effect of us. So tell me what you think, obviously Operation Black Cat 4 is dedicated to the service of Vietnam veterans. What's it like when you see events like this for you, when you see that people, there's people in organizations that want to give recognition to our veterans that era? Well, that's, that, that's really great. And I, uh, uh, we do a lot of, um, I'm, my West Point class is working with the Vietnam 50th uh, commemorative program where uh, we hand out, make sure that if, when we go to these events that we do, if a vet comes up to the helicopter and we says we could tell he was a Vietnam vet, then we say welcome home and we give him the Major General Wayne Jackson, who's part of our crew. We actually hand him a package that has a proclamation, say welcome home, the little lapel pin. Um, we had we did one show up in Stewart at a. a Harley Davidson dealership, and we had our UE there, and we weren't. We were there, and this lady comes up to us, and she says, "Can I talk with you?" And I said, "Yeah." She says, "See that man over there? It's my boyfriend. He's a Vietnam vet. He was a door gunner on a UE. He told me that if he knew this helicopter was here, he wouldn't have come because he had such bad feelings about the helicopter." And so we said, okay. So during the event, we would take turns because uh, I was a POW. Uh, Kurt Rich was a crew chief on a UE in Vietnam. Mike Carroll was in Vietnam, a crew chief on a Chinook. 
Uh, Bill Jesuit was a, a Chinook pilot, won the Silver Star. So, so we're all Vietnam veterans. Uh, Major General Jackson was tail end of World War II, Korea, Vietnam. So we took turns walking over to him and talking to him and introducing ourselves. And we'd get him a little closer to the UE, a little closer to the UE. By the end of the event, we had him sitting in the UE. And uh, his wife, I mean his wife, his, his girlfriend came back after that and she said thank you so much because it, it, it really changed him for, uh, he needed that release. And we see that every time we do take our, uh, our UE, we see the guys standing there looking at him. We could tell he's a Vietnam vet. And uh, so when we have these organizations uh, that honor the Vietnam vets, uh, it's, it's important. Uh, and not so much for me, because I think I got a welcome home. But these guys, the, uh, the guys that are on the ground, uh, or the pilots uh, prior to that, they were never welcomed home. And now we see that more and more. Um, and you even see some ads on television where people are growing up to the current guys and thanking them for their service, where they, where they have a Vietnam vet sitting at the bar there, you know, drinking coffee, and and then they point them out and say, you know, thank you for your service. So it's a very important, and I, uh, I we still have, we still meet people that I say we'd like to give you this lapel pin, and they, ah, I don't want to, I don't, I hate my experience, I, you know, and it's it's sad that that, that we still do that. Um. So do you think, I mean, I, I sense, and I don't know if you agree, but there's a bit of a shift. We, our World War II veterans, just by the, the math, are, are, are leaving us. Mm -hmm. And there's a bit of a passing the guard to the Korea, the Vietnam soldiers. Do you, do you see that there's kind of a little more recognition or at least remembrance is starting to shift? Uh, I think it is. Um, of course, the Vietnam, I mean, the World War II guys, I mean, uh, like my dad, when he came home, they came home on these big, troop transports, you know, three or four days. Uh, they were in, in England or, you know, they had, the war was over, they had time to decompress a little, you know, and them getting home and then, the, and then you could see, and they won the war, you know, so everybody was, you know, and then it, it really you saw the turn in the attitude with Korea. It was like, you know, even the attitude with the, uh, the World War II guys to the Korean guys, you know, you guys lost the war, you know, and then, and then the same thing to us, you know, you guys, Vietnam veterans, you know, you were lost to war. Um, um, and, and a lot of the World War II guys fought in Korea. We had some, uh, we had a, some POWs that flew in, in World War II, Korea, and were shot down in, in Vietnam. Um, but, you know, they, I think the last count was uh, the POWs from World War II. In another five years, they'll, they'll all be all be gone. And the, and the Korean Wars guys are about the same. And there's only 400. There's only 600 of us. And then Gulf, the Gulf War and the um, Afghan. There is maybe a handful of POWs. The ones. World War II and Korea generation are gone. There's a the the, the focus of I don't know. I, I kind of feel like we're, it's going to be forgotten. You know, the history is going to be forgotten because they're not there anymore. Um, and the and the World War II guys uh, were great. The Korean guys. We have a. Um, uh, a group here. I'm on the POW advocate for uh, West Palm Beach uh, uh, VA, and I think at one time we had about 100 POWs in the group, World War II, Korea, and Vietnam, and now we're lucky to get four or five. Uh, and um, I, I just feel that uh, we can't stop, we can't forget. You know, you, you got to always remember because, uh, you know, I think if once you forget, then you're going to make the same mistakes that uh, we made in the past. But when you talk to these these kids at schools, what, what what's your motivation? What what do you get out of it, and what's the message you want to give kids when you talk to them? Well, I, I want them to know the story. I want them to know some history. 
And uh, for me, it's important. And I, I don't go into a lot of the, 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 I just, I bring in, it's like a show and tell, because I'll take stuff off the walls and bring things in and I'll have the table set up. And so I'll tell them my experience and they'll ask questions and then they can walk through and see all this stuff. It's important that they understand, uh, they don't get taught history anymore, you know, and, and it's, it's just important. And um, I'll see them in public, Publix or anything there, and they'll say, hey, Captain Bill, you know, and it's like, and I talked to one mother that she said, my daughter came home and she, she was so, I, I couldn't stop her from talking about, you know, you know, so they were appreciative that we did it. it it's important that they understand what, and a lot of them, I was surprised, have relatives, family members in the service serving uh, because of the, the use of the National Guard and the reserves in these current, these, these current conflicts uh, that weren't used as much in, uh, in the past. So they know that uh, and that's, it's important to them and to me. What about an event like this? So let's talk about Black Hat. Yep. We're going to come there. We're going to, you're going to get together. A lot of people want to meet with you. What's it like when you get together with military brothers and sisters in an event like this and talk about your experience? Well, it's, there's such a brotherhood. I mean, we always consider ourselves, you know, they, 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 and the most famous one was the Band of Brothers in, in uh, World War II. But we're all brothers and we all, no matter what service we were in, we joke about each other and we kid each other. But when it comes down to uh, we're, we have everybody's back, you know, and, and we can talk to them because they can relate where you might talk to someone who's never served and they got no concept of what it's like, uh, not just for the serviceman or servicewoman deploying, but for the family that's left behind, that has to, you know, my wife, and she, you know, she got a, a knock on the door and there was the base commander and uh, the doctor and they're handing her a telegram saying that we regret to inform you that your husband is missing in action. And uh, people don't under, can't comprehend that. And so when we go to these events where they start to honor the, uh, the Vietnam veterans, long overdue, uh, and I think most of the people are sincere, uh, and, a, and a lot of it is m military, you know. Uh, there are some civi uh, civilian organizations that will do it, but y it's, it's just a camaraderie that you get together and you can talk and you can joke about stuff, and, uh, and it's just, uh, it's, it's, it's fun, you know, it's, it's, it's fun.